Okay, once again, thank you for coming to this presentation of the San Antonio Tea Party. We like to bring in our uh, program as we do for all of our Tea Party events with, uh, with a prayer. And I ask Jeannie Spence to come up here and give us the prayer, please. Please bow your heads in prayer with me, please. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we come to honor you this evening. We acknowledge that you are the only one who can rightly lead and guide our country. Lord, we lift up prayer for our country. We ask that you would bless our country with your wisdom, your love, and your compassion. May we be a people who are pursuing you and your plans for us, individually and corporately. Lord, we ask for blessings on our leaders. May these servants who are in positions of authority take that responsibility seriously and do their very best each day. May they realize their need for you and for your direction. May they hear your voice, Lord, as they make their decisions, and may they follow your guidance. May they have a passion for people, for truth, and for righteousness. Lord, we lift up prayer for our troops. Lord, we ask for blessings on our servicemen and women. We ask protection for all of our men and women in uniform, both here and around the world. We are grateful for their service and their dedication to keeping our nation safe. We pray that you would keep them safe. We ask a special blessing on our guest tonight, Mr. Trevor Loudon. And as he travels this country, sharing his, his extensive research, we just ask your blessings on him to keep him safe and to just open doors for him and just let him be a blessing to, to all that he meets and shares with. We thank you for our blessings of life and liberty. May our country continually show love and honor to you. And we ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Okay, would all please rise for the <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the pledge to the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Please be seated. Once again, we'd like to give thanks to George Butler and his live on location TV, dot TV folks for coming up in here, coming up and uh, down from Austin and cut to cover this occasion. Mr. Loudon is on a book tour. That's why we have books back there, okay? And um, he's selling his, his newest book is The Enemies Within, Communists, Socialists, and Progressives in the U.S. Congress. And if you want to learn all about it, I think he had to um, extend his research, research time and finally, finally hit a, a deadline to get that thing out to print as it keeps growing. Mr. Loudon is from New Zealand. He's an author, speaker, political activist, who maintains a prolific and controversial entitled, a blog entitled New Zeal. If you've never been to the New Zeal blog, that's a real treat. It's a daily, a daily treat on my part, too. <clears throat> His main major claim to fame, or where he came to a lot of attention, and of course, a lot of us saw him in the movie 2016, Barack Obama's America. He was interviewed uh, extensively through that and other documentaries that have been done. But his book that's for sale back there in the center of the table, Barack Obama and the Enemies Within, is when he exposed the ties of President Obama to communist and communist parties. His upbringing in uh, Hawaii and his tutoring by a communist by the name of Frank Marshall Davis. And those probably aren't names that are strange to many of you, but this man is the one we have to thank for bringing that to light. And he's also the one that uh, exposed Van Jones as a communist that was actually a czar uh, within the White House. And uh, we applaud him for that and uh, managed to get that fellow off our payroll one way or the other. But there are many more of them out there. 
And I would like to ask Mr. Loudon to come up and give us a talk about his books and his life and his research. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. That's, that's excellent. Um, I love coming to Texas. This is the first place I realized I had an, ac an accent. <laughs> because um, you might know Brandon Darby. Um, he's, an, he's a former anarchist out of Austin who became a conservative and now works for the Breitbart Network. And I told him I was coming down to Texas. And he said, where's Texas? And that's the first time I understood that I... I talk funny. But look, it's an honour to be here. I just want to say too, it's also great because I've got two Kiwi friends here today. Um, one's Wes over here who's from Texas but he met a Kiwi girl and ended up in New Zealand. And Blair over here who's from New Zealand, I used to work with him in politics and he met a Texan girl and ended up over here. So it's great to see both of them here tonight. Um, look, I love coming to this state because America is not a unitary country. America is a federation of independent states. And nobody knows that better than you guys. You know? You are the only independent republic to join the union. And that independent streak remains now. And that independent streak is one of the great hopes for this country. And that there's so much good coming out of Texas, guys, and I'll be talking about that as I carry on. Now, it's my second tour here. I've been down to the Alamo, and I've felt the presence there. You know, you go into that place, and the only other time I've felt that was in a little mission in Carmel in California. You just feel something there, and that something is still with us today. So, look, first thing, everybody always asks me, why I should care about the United States? Why do I come from 12,000 miles away to talk about your internal politics? Well, I said there's two basic reasons. The first is simple gratitude. My country was only saved in World War II from invasion by the Japanese armies by the huge sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers in the battles of, coral, of the Coral Sea and Midway and Guadalcanal. And as Blair will attest, that memory is still strong in my country today. The second reason is related, but it's a little more selfish. Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom fails in the United States, if you lose your economy, your constitution, and your military superiority, freedom will fail everywhere. If you guys go down, the whole West goes down. If you guys go down, the bad guys, I'm talking Russia, China, Iran, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, North Korea, and their crazed Islamic allies will carve up this planet amongst themselves. Now, we down in New Zealand, most of us are pretty cocky because we think nobody's ever going to bother us. Way down there where the penguins live, you know. But just a few hundred miles to the north of my country lie the beautiful Fijian Islands. Wonderful place, but the Chinese are now training the Fijian military. They're building big hydroelectric dams on the islands. Fiji is now a Chinese client state. And that's happening right throughout the Pacific. Just a few months ago, the Australian Minister of Defence was in China for talks. And a top Chinese general publicly told him, he said, now is the time for Australia to choose. Do you stay under American protection or do you come under Chinese protection? And if you are smart, you will, you, you will choose China because we are the growing power in the region. Now, he wouldn't have been cocky enough to say that under Bush, certainly not under Reagan, maybe not even under Clinton, but he's confident to say it now because he knows the leadership in your White House and what it stands for. And all around this planet, your allies from Israel to Germany to Britain to Canada to South Korea to Japan to Australia are all basically freaking out 
because they see that your president loves the bad guys more than he loves the good guys. And that's causing huge instability throughout the world. Israel is backed into a corner now because your president has destroyed all their allies in the region. They haven't got a friend left. And they may have to take desperate measures, measures that might put us into World War III. Japan, which was never supposed to rearm after World War II, is now rearming. But can you blame them? Would you trust Obama to protect you from China and North Korea? So that's where it's going, folks. American power and prestige is going down and down and down. And that was very evident when your president called for Western support to go into Syria a little while ago. All your allies were lining up, right? Couldn't wait to get involved. Couldn't wait to stand with Mr. Obama. After the great support he gave to Poland and Czechoslovakia by removing their missile shield. After the way he betrayed Georgia. After the way he's betraying Israel now. You wonder why your allies will no longer stand with you. And I'm not saying you should go into Syria, far from it. But it's an indication of where American prestige is going around the world. You know, when the Pope put out a message about Syria recently, he didn't address it to Obama, he addressed it to Vladimir Putin, a life, lifelong KGB man. He has more prestige now than your president, which is a pretty sad state of affairs. So, you know, there is nowhere to run. You know, I get emails all the time, they say, look, guy, look, if things turn bad in America, can I come down and live in New Zealand? And I say, look, come down, you'll love the place, the people are great, the politics will drive you nuts, but it's a wonderful country. But it isn't a refuge, nowhere is. Not Costa Rica, not Belize, not anywhere. This is the last stand. This is the final battlefield of freedom. In World War II, you, your guys went to fight in Europe. Right now, the main battlefield is in Virginia, and Ohio, and Colorado, and Florida, the battleground states. That's where the fate of the Western world is going to be decided. So, my book, The Enemies Within, Communists, Socialists, and Progressives in the United States Congress. Now, my first book, Barack Obama and the Enemies Within, was 700 pages. And I got sick of lugging that around... That was pretty heavy. And I promised the next book would be smaller. But the bloody commies just kept on coming. Okay? I couldn't leave out Sheila Jackson Lee, could I? Or, or Eddie Bernice Johnson. And I almost got one of the Castro brothers in, but maybe for the next time. You know, and I'll talk about those guys later. But, uh, Fidel... Well, it's hard to tell the difference, okay? Only two brothers haven't got enough power yet, but if they did, they'd be just like the other ones. Okay, so the enemies within. Now, you'd have to be pretty confident of your case to write a book with a title like that 20 years after the collapse of the Berlin Wall if you didn't want to be laughed out of the country. I've spent five years in libraries all over this country from South Central LA to Madison, Wisconsin, you know, Seattle, New York, all the liberal, you know, all the liberal dens of iniquity, researching and digging and delving. And it isn't actually hard to find this stuff if you're prepared to look for it. So the book is really about the takeover of the U.S. Congress. It profiles 51 members of Congress, uh, House of Representatives and 14 senators. And it's about the two big secrets of communism in the modern world. Now the first secret, I think they borrowed it from the devil, which is not surprising, because we all know the cleverest thing the devil ever did was to convince people he doesn't exist. And what have the communists done in the last 20 years? They faked their own death, exactly, sir. They've convinced most of us they don't exist, and if they do, they aren't a threat. And they've made a lot of headway by doing that. The second big secret of communism, 
And this is hardly ever written about, if ever. And this is the guts of my book. It is the ability of a tiny Marxist-Leninist party to influence and control the legislative process in their country. Now in this country, there's approximately 20,000 card-carrying communists. Well, actually 19,999 after the death of John Stanford this week in San Antonio, the leader of your local communist party. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what I'm saying is, those 20,000 are dictating policy in a country of over 300 million people. A very small tail is wagging a very big dog. Now that sounds a pretty far-fetched claim, and I don't expect you to swallow it, but I just ask you to consider, like, when these guys actually stand for public office occasionally, they get 20 votes or 75 votes, and people laugh at them. How could these people be of any influence whatsoever? But it isn't just the number of votes you get that determine your political influence. There's a man called Al Capone. How many votes did he ever get in Chicago? Telling me he didn't run that city? How many votes does the mafia get in Sicily these days? Telling me they don't run that province? Extortion, ba backroom deals, indoctrination, subversion, espionage, you know, standover tactics, vote fraud. There's a whole bunch of ways that small groups can control whole countries. And the communists have had more than 80 years of practice at this. This is what they do. 2,000 Bolsheviks took over Russia, a country of 160 million people at the time. They don't need big numbers to have a lot of effect. They have the science of Marxism-Leninism on their side, and that's a very powerful science. The Marxism side is crap, but the Leninism is very, very effective, because it's all about gaining power. So, to, you know, I'm making a point here, but how about some examples? You know, I've got to prove myself. I'm going to give an example from New Zealand first, and I'm sure Blair will have some memories of this, as will Wes. Now, back in 1984, we elected a socialist Labour government. The first thing they did, the most important thing they did, well, they did some economic stuff, but on the foreign policy arena, the first thing they did was to enact a ban on nuclear warships entering our harbours. Now, as you country, your country was the only people ever sending nuclear warships to our harbours, overnight that destroyed the Australia-New Zealand-United States military alliance, killed it stone cold dead. And it still hasn't been revived to this day. So how could that happen? How could a pro-Western, pro-American country like New Zealand, at the height of the Cold War, so willingly turn its back on the Western alliance? Well, this is how it was done. A few months after, a few years after that, I had the privilege over several months of interviewing a New Zealander who had, who had, uh, who had infiltrated our local Communist Party, the Socialist Unity Party, for our security intelligence services, the equivalent of your FBI. And in 1983, he was given the greatest honour any communist could enjoy, he and three other comrades were chosen to go to Moscow to study at Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning and Leningradsky Prospect. And that is like going to Mecca for a communist. Now this was not a small institute. This was six and a half thousand students at any one time. Some of them with one-to-one -one tutelage, many of them on seven-year courses. This was the training academy of the future world communist leadership. And incidentally, my friend was there just at the time your President Reagan sent troops in to liberate Grenada in the Caribbean. And the Soviets were absolutely spitting tax. They were livid. They were livid that your bloody Ronald Reagan had shut down what was going to become the second Cuba of the Caribbean. So we have Mr. Reagan to thank for that one, as well as many other things. So 
These guys were training in Moscow. All of them were taught Russian history to build loyalty to, to Moscow. They were taught trade union building. They were taught espionage techniques. They were taught racial agitation. But the most important thing they were taught, particularly the Western comrades, was how to take Moscow's policies back to their country and by using the labour unions and the peace movement, make them the policy of the government of the day, of their country. I've just got to backtrack, I've left something out. The big way that the communists, in, in, communists change policy in your country is through the use of the labour unions. Now the labour unions are only 11%, 12% of your workforce, even fewer in a work to right state like yours. But if you can control the labour, but by, and, and in your country you are very lucky because your AFL-CIO was for many years run by anti-communists like Lane Kirkland and George Meany. But in 1995 there was a coup. That year Democratic Socialists of America, your largest Marxist group, took over the AFL-CIO and they put their man John Sweeney in as president. And now their man Richard Trumka, their protege, is carrying on the job. Now what that did was give them control effectively of the Democratic Party. Because there's hardly a Democrat elected official at any level in this country who does not owe his job to the labour unions. They rely on the unions for manpower, for money, for people to commit vote fraud for them, whatever. And they know that he who pays the piper calls the tune. If the unions tell them to jump, they jump. If the unions tell them to put forward a certain policy, they put forward that policy. If the unions tell the Democrats to put forward a certain candidate, that's what they do. So the communists set a policy. They make that labour union policy, and the labour unions, by block voting at Democratic Party conventions and pressuring the representatives, make it Democratic Party policy. So this was, that's how they do it. Now, Moscow 1983, this was a time of the massive anti-nuclear marches through Europe. Hundreds of thousands of Europeans were marching through Rome and Germany and Berlin and Brussels and Paris, waving big ban the bomb signs, get us out of NATO, get America out of Europe all anti-NATO stuff. And there was a big fear that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which you guys are the linchpin of, might break up. And of course the Soviets were funding all of this and directing it because they wanted to take NATO down so they could take control of Europe. And I will tell you, back in 1983, as today in 2013, your military is Moscow's number one target. Number one. Because they know if they can take out your military, that will give Russia and China and Iran and all of their allies everything they want, which is basically everything. That's why Putin, despite the little spat over Syria right now, loves Obama like a chocolate. Because he is giving them, he is giving Putin everything he wants. He's destroying your military right before your eyes. And if that goes down far enough, folks, I'll tell you what, your enemies will not sit on their hands and let you rebuild. They will take their chance if it gets bad enough. And uh, you won't be having any allies come to your aid, I can tell you that, on current patterns. So... They had this game going on in Europe, but they thought, well, they're subtle, they're chess players. They thought, well, okay, this is going on in Europe. How about we take another country outside of Europe, out of the Western Alliance, and we can use the propaganda value of that to spur on the destruction of NATO. So they chose New Zealand because we're small, progressive, socially liberal, and the communists controlled our unions. They controlled our peace movement and at that time had heavily infiltrated our Labour Party. But they had a problem. They knew they couldn't sell this as an anti-American thing because New Zealand was too pro-American. And when I say sell, I mean that. If you think American corporations are good at selling and marketing, 
mass media, marketing, etc. They got nothing on the Russians. They have had 80 years of practice at influencing Western public opinion. They're still at it today with their Russia Today, etc. They have psychologists, they have marketing experts, sociologists. Every country in the world they have mapped out the religious makeup, the cultural makeup, the sporting events, the whole culture. They know what messages will sell in each country and they tailor it accordingly. So they got these KGB experts, they sat down with this four member delegation from New Zealand and they worked out some slogans. This was going to have to be patriotic New Zealand stuff, not anti-American. It was going to have to be Kiwi standing up for peace. New Zealanders standing against the nuclear arms race. Kiwi striking independent foreign policy course. So these four guys went back to New Zealand. They held secret meetings with the Labour Party, even signed a contract with them in the hotel workers' union rooms in Marion Street in Wellington. Secret meetings with the unions, the peace movement. They mounted a campaign and in a few short months, legislation was in front of the New Zealand Parliament. It was signed off and our alliance with your country was dead. Just like that. The Soviets could not believe how quickly it went. They were overjoyed. And I will tell you, if you talk to any Kiwi today, and now you know what their accents sound like, you know, if you're down at Disney World or something and you, they all go there, you'll hear some. Say, guys, hey, I hear about this anti-nuclear thing in the 80s. What do you think of that? I say 90% of them will puff out their chest with pride and say, yeah, we did it. We stood up for peace. We were the mouse that roared. Be so proud. And hardly one of them in four million people has any idea that those policies they so love so iconic in New Zealand today, even the Conservatives don't dare touch them. They have no idea that they were designed by the KGB at Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning in Moscow. A whole country was suckered. And that happens all over the Western world on a regular basis. Thank you. Okay. A few, a few, um, a few months ago, your president held a meeting in Washington with the, communist premier, with the communist premier of Vietnam. Is it still? No, it's gone now. Am I okay? With the, communist, with the premier of communist Vietnam. And he made a statement during that meeting that caused some controversy on the conservative blogosphere. Mr. Obama said that Ho Chi Minh who was the communist leader of Vietnam during the war, was a huge admirer of Thomas Jefferson and the American Constitution. Can you believe that one? Well, it's true, in a way, in a, in a strange way. But the fact that Obama said that, a man who was mentored at the knee of a professional communist propagandist like Frank Marshall Davis, show, he would have known the backstory. This was Obama sending a little subtle message to the troops. I'm still on your side, guys, don't worry. Now, the back story is this. During World War II, Ho Chi Minh, a 20-year veteran of the Communist Party, a man with a lot of blood on his hands, a Stalinist who trained at the Lenin School in Moscow, was fighting the Japanese invaders with his guerrilla army. And he was working with your OSS, your Office of, Office of Strategic Services, to do that. That's the forerunner of your CIA. Now that organization was heavily infiltrated by communists because Wild Bill Donovan, the man who set it up, deliberately recruited veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigades, the American communists who fought for Stalin in the Spanish Civil War because he wanted people with European military experience. And those people were never fully cleaned out, so your CIA was penetrated from day one. But notice they worked, they worked in Spain as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, not the Karl Marx Brigade or the Vladimir Lenin Brigade or the Joseph Stalin Brigade, just as the communists had an Abraham Lincoln School in Chicago and a Jefferson School in New York. They loved to cloak their revolution under the guise of your revolution. And your president does the same thing today. 
So Ho Chi Minh got rid of the French, it got rid of the uh, Japanese. The next mission was to get rid of the French colonialists who returned after the war. Now Uncle Ho thought, well FDR doesn't like the French very much, I'm going to get the Americans to help us to get rid of the French too. He wrote letters to FDR asking for help, but he knew he had to get American public opinion on his side. And he couldn't go that if he was going around talk, do that if he was talking about Marxism, Marxism, Leninism and the dictatorship of the proletariat. He'd have to talk about Thomas Jefferson and the American Revolution. And that's what he did, went all around Vietnam doing that. He did a big rally in downtown Hanoi in front of thousands of people, a whole bunch of OSS officers. I support Thomas Jefferson. He's the greatest revolutionary leader in history. The American Revolution and the American Constitution is a model for Vietnam. The Bill of Rights, the greatest political document ever written. All designed to suck in American public opinion to get them on side with fighting the French. But FDR died and Harry Truman, a real Democrat, took over and he was nowhere near as stupid. He wouldn't have a bar of Ho Chi Minh, wouldn't have a bar of him. So Ho Chi Minh went openly communist, got the Russians on board and eventually started the war. Now, just a point too, you know, in those days, Democrats, particularly in the South, were often more conservative than the Republicans. It was the Democrats that set up the House Un-American Activities Committee. It was Harry Truman that Frank Marshall Davis used to call a fascist for his opposition to communism. And it's just a sad thing that today's Democrats still think they're voting for Harry Truman and JFK. They don't realise that when the unions took, got taken over, so did their party. And Joe Lieberman was the last of the old guard to stand. And where did he go? So, so, so they got, so Obama also made another statement after that in that in little meeting which was very significant. He said something like, Americans have to get on board with helping Vietnam repair the damage done during the war. Now what that means is your taxpayers' money is going to go to Vietnam to repair the damage done by your troops with Agent Orange and bombing. Now there's a little communist group in this country called the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism. See that word democracy to hide what they do? It's a break away from the Communist Party USA. Its most famous member is Angela Davis. I'm sure you remember who with the big afro, the murder charges, whatever. Now their favourite country is Vietnam. They're allied to Vietnam. They're always sending delegations over there. Now a few years ago they set up the Vietnam Agent Orange, Agent Orange Responsibility Campaign. A front group which was designed to lobby your Congress to make your taxpayers pay reparations to Vietnam for the damage you guys did during that war. Now I'm a bit old fashioned but I sort of thought reparations were what the bad guys paid to the good guys. Isn't that how it used to work? So how come the good guys are now going to be paying reparations to the bad guys who started the war? Now the Committees of Correspondence has brought a whole bunch of delegations from Vietnam to appear in front of your Congress with sob stories about the effects of Agent Orange and how terrible it is. They've even brought little girls with no legs to, to sit in front of your Congress to jerk the tears out of your congressmen. The committees has also enlisted the aid of several members of your House of Representatives and several of your Senators. Jeff Merkley, Tom Harkin, um, Al Franken out of Minnesota, um, John Conyers from Michigan, and you'll be shocked to hear that Sheila Jackson Lee has climbed on board. That'll blow you away. And before he left Congress and became a famous sex pest in San Diego, Bob Filner. Bob Filner was even sent to Vietnam a couple of years ago to negotiate these reparations. He was sent 
paid for on the dime of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, an old Soviet front now run by the Cubans. A communist old front paid one of your congressmen to go to a communist country to negotiate reparations from your country to theirs. They've even enlisted that great patriot, Charlie Sheen, to narrate, to narrate a documentary for them. So they have built this campaign up and now they've got a bill before your Congress to grant reparations from your country to Vietnam. Now I know that there are people in this country who are still suffering today from the effects of Agent Orange, many of them living in homeless shelters, some on the streets, many in hospitals, many of them in dire, dire straits, still suffering 40 or 50 years later. Now there's never enough money for those guys, is there? But your president thinks there's enough money to send to Vietnam to bail out their country, the country that started that war, and it won't even go to the soldiers in Vietnam. It'll go to the Vietnamese government to do with what they see fit. And it won't be something nice, I can, be, I can assure you. Does that make you angry in any way? I think it should. And that's 300 communists influencing public policy in your country today. And it's all in my book. The whole chapter's called The Vietnam Scam. All the photographs, it's all there. Now what about a bigger example? This one should resonate in Texas. Immigration, specifically amnesty for at least 12 million illegal immigrants and voting rights. Now you've got some people in the GOP like dear old Marco Rubio and John McCain and Lindsey Graham, all your favourites, okay, who tell you that this is going to be good for the Republican Party because the Latinos are all going to start voting GOP, right? Just like those 90% of blacks in this country vote, you know, are all going to vote for the GOP after voting Democrat for more than 50 years. Just like the 80% 80 of the Jewish population of this country who have been voting Democrat for more than 100 years are all going to switch. I would suggest that the only reason these people are pushing this line is because they're allied with certain business interests in the Chamber of Commerce who are really, really keen to get cheap labour to run their factories and farms. And I think that's what they're more in love with than your border security or your national integrity. Damn that. Just so those guys can make more money in their factories and farms, make a quick buck, to hell with America's security. Now why do the left want this? Because they're driving this. Why are they putting all their effort into a bill getting getting amnesty before your Congress. Well, this movement goes back some time. It goes back to California in the 50s. Now there was a man in California then, actually came from San Antonio. His father fought in the Mexican Revolution. He went to, he came, grew up in San Antonio, moved to California as a young man. He was called Bert Corona. Became a Communist Party member, also a leading member of the Democratic Party. He set up the Viva Kennedy Clubs in the 60s, which were the first organised effort to bring Latinos into the, Repu into the Democratic Party. He also set up numerous immigrants' rights organisations all through the Southwest, and set up groups to lobby against any attempt to crack down on illegal immigration. He trained hundreds of protégés, three of whom are very prominent today. The first is a man called Gil Cedillo, a hardcore Marxist who was until recently a California state senator. And he got the DREAM Act pushed through in California a couple of years ago, which granted rights to the children of illegal immigrants. The other, the, another one of Corona's protégés was Antonio Villagarosa himself, until recently the mayor of LA. Now Coro uh, Villagarosa is a hardcore Marxist went to Cuba as a young man to pick sugar cane for Castro, the Cuban Castros, with the Venceremos brigades. He made LA a sanctuary city by forbidding the LAPD from enforcing immigration laws. And the illegals flooded in, changed the demographics and the whole makeup of that city and Southern California as a whole. 
The third person in this little triumvirate is Maria Elena Durazzo, the current head of the California Labour Movement, most powerful woman in that state and another hardcore Marxist. She has led the Labour Union voting, voting registration drives over the last 15 years to sign up hundreds and thousands of, of Latino voters. She has changed the voting patterns right through Southern California. And the three of those people working together under Corona's guidance have turned what was once a red purple state into this, one of the bluest states of the union, all through the promotion of immigration and voting registration drives. And that has been a deliberate Marxist ploy. Change that state forever. Even Orange County, once the most conservative region in your country, is now purple. All because of their work. Another man to think about is a guy called Lorenzo Torres. Died last year. An Arizona guy. I would say one of the most successful politicians to come out of that state in decades. And I guarantee most Arizonans have never heard of him. He was the head of the, of the Communist Party USA's Latino Commission. And his job was to coordinate support networks for illegal immigrants across the entire Southwest, from Texas to California, from, from Arizona to Nevada, New Mexico, the whole lot. He also set up big Latino voting drives and set up campaigns against any crackdowns on illegal immigration. He was the leader behind the anti-SB70 campaign a couple of years ago. He also was the man who, gave, who basically gave Arizona three Communist Party affiliated members of the House of Representatives currently serving. Arizona, one of the reddest states in the Union, one of the most libertarian, has three Communist Party affiliated Congress members. Raul Grijalva, that'll shock you. Ed, Ed Pastor and Kirsten Sinema, the later new freshman, all affiliated to the Communist Party USA. All of them exposed in my book. The third person to consider is still with us today, a man called Alisea Medina. He's the executive vice president of the SEIU union, the largest union in your country and the one with the biggest Latino membership. He is the leader of the immigrants' rights movement in this country today. He is the reason that bill got before your Senate, and, he's still, and recently he's been organising rallies outside of Republican congressmen's offices, union rallies all over this country, to pressure Republican reps to put a bill before your Congress in this session. He is a driving force. And he works closely with Grijalva. He works closely with the leader of that movement in the House of Representatives, Luis Gutierrez, a representative from Illinois, a former member of the pro-Cuban Puerto Rican Socialist Party, another Marxist-Leninist in your Congress. Medina has also served on Mr Obama's Latino Advisory Commission. He's a member of Democratic Socialists of America and a big time supporter of the Communist Party USA. And to prove a point, which organisation folks in this country 20 years ago was the most hardcore anti-illegal immigrant organisation in the country? Who was lobbying Congress continually to increase penalties for any employer who employed illegal immigrants? The AFL-CIO. Because they saw that illegal immigrants were unfair competition for their members. That they would drive wages and conditions out the bottom. Now, which organisation in this country is leading the charge for the legalisation of illegal immigrants? The AFL-CIO. Why the change? Well, there was a big change in 95, right? Because before 1995, the AFL-CIO was there to represent the interests of workers. Now, illegal immigrants, but after 1995, it became there to promote Marxist revolution. Because that's when the coup took place. 
So illegal immigrants are bad for workers, but they are real good for socialist revolution. And that is why the AFL-CIO is today busily selling out their own membership to promote illegal immigration because they see it as a path to socialist revolution. And the man who organised that about face was Alisao Medina because it's not easy to get union members to vote against their own interests. But Alisao Medina campaigned for several years and in 2000, I think it was down in... Um, yeah, it was down in Los Angeles at the AFL-CIO's convention that year. They changed the policy under his direction from anti-illegal immigrant to pro-illegal immigrant. And that from that point on, the unions were selling out their members in favour of illegal immigrants. So why do they want this? Well, of course they want more members, but that's not the main reason. Alessio Medina let the cat out of the bag at a big progressive conference in Washington DC two years ago. It's all quoted in my book. He got up in front of the progressives and said, our number one priority for this movement is to get an immigration bill passed through your Congress and Senate. We have to give amnesty and voting rights to our illegal, our undocumented workers. And did he talk about compassion or reuniting families? or reinvigorating the economy, or giving immigrants an even break. Not a bar of it, not a word. All he talked about was the numbers. Because he said this, in 2008, the Latinos in this country voted 80% for Barack Obama and progressive candidates. If we stand by them now, and we get them voting rights and citizenships, they will support us. That will give us at least 8 million more votes for the Democratic Party. That will give us a governing majority, not just for the next few election cycles, but for the foreseeable future. In other words, a Democratic Party, one party state, led by the Marxists. Because you think about it, folks, they get 8 million more votes... Several million of those will be here. If they get Texas blue, which they are working on full on now, if they can do to you what they did to California, if they can get the two biggest states in the union to go blue and get the electoral college votes from California and Texas, no matter what they do in the rest of the country, it will be mathematically impossible for the Republicans to ever win another presidential election. It cannot be done. That is why your state is so crucial. That's why they want to take your state blue. And that's why they want amnesty. Nothing to do with compassion. It's all about socialist takeover. And you've got these dumb GOPers. And I won't say they were dumb. I would say they're treacherous. Who want to sell you on the idea that this is going to help the GOP. This is going to destroy the GOP, but more than that, it will destroy your country as you know it. And those guys need to be gotten rid of, primed out, post-haste. Okay, another example. Anybody here heard of Obamacare? <laughs> One or two of you? No, I hope you don't. I'm really hoping you don't, because you've got you to stop that immigration bill. You've got to defund Obamacare. Now, why does the left want this? Well, is it to give Auntie Mabel her knee operation? Is it to help the guy in the homeless shelter get cover? It's all about power, folks. And what they refer to, the left refer to this, they go back to Britain in the 1930s. Because at that time, the British working class was very solidly conservative voting. They were pro-king, pro-country, very patriotic. They didn't want a bar of that bloody socialist Labour Party. But after 1946, with the Beveridge Report and the introduction of the National Health Service, that shifted, within 10 years, the bulk of the British working class behind the socialist Labour Party. Because no matter how bad 
socialist health care is, and I come from a country that has a lot of it, and you probably agree with me, Blair, it ain't so good, is it? It ain't, it ain't flash. But the thing is, if that's all you've got, you will vote for the party who's going to keep it, not the party who's going to take it away. This is about locking you behind the Democratic Party forever. Because once it's in, it's in. And think about this, you know, there's a, an argument. Some of these people say, well, look, everybody's going to get coverage, and that's fair and pre-existing conditions. But okay, the simple argument is this. Because they all think the quality is going to be the same. The simple argument is this. In a free market healthcare system, and I know it's not free market here, but at least you have strong elements of it, you are a customer. And are you people in business here, folks, how do you treat your customers? As best you can, right? Build up friendships, relationships, you get repeat business, referrals, that's your lifeblood. But if you've got a socialist system and the budget is this big and everybody's needs have to come out of that, you become a liability. And how do you treat your liabilities, folks? You get rid of them as soon as you can. So if you've got a socialist system and you're a 75-year-old guy with prostate cancer, and you need $100,000 worth of chemotherapy to extend your life by three or four years, and your next door neighbor who's 25 has got leukemia, and he needs $100,000 worth of chemotherapy to save his life, who do you think is going to get the treatment? Well, maybe. But I know who's going to have a better chance. You know, that 75-year-old guy is basically going to be put in a little room in a hospital and given lots of palliative drugs and left to quietly die. Now, Blair may disagree with me, but I think in New Zealand, rationing is just regarded as normal. We don't even see it as rationing. We just know if you're old or infirm, you don't get the same treatment as someone who's young and paying taxes. And if you're a woman in New Zealand and you've got breast cancer, you don't hang around to get the second grade drugs in New Zealand. If you're rich enough, you go to Australia and you pay for it yourself. I could tell you a whole lot of horror stories about our health system. Our government doubled our health care budget in six years. Hardly a measurable increase in outcomes. A few years ago, they instituted a law because the waiting lists were getting so long. Nobody could be on a waiting list for more than six months. Sounds good, doesn't it? But what that meant was, at the end of six months, you go back to your GP, and he may put you back on the list, or he may not. That's how they fudge the figures. That's how it works. It can only work by rationing. Now, the father of the single-payer or socialised healthcare movement in this country is a retired Chicago doctor named Quentin Young. Now, the guy's pushing 90 now, and in my darker moments, I wish he'd gone to Britain 15 years ago, because he probably wouldn't be with us now. But he stayed here and enjoyed your system, right? Now, he's set up the Physicians for a National Health Plan, a whole bunch of other organisations, worked inside your AMA, worked with Canadian doctors, worked with congressmen like John Conyers, worked with the unions. He's had single-payer bills in front of your Congress on several occasions. They came close under Hillary, but that failed. But in 2009, with the Affordable Health Care Act, they finally started to make some progress. And it's not surprising that the progress came under Mr. Obama, because for many years in Chicago, Quentin Young was Barack Obama's personal physician. He openly claims credit for indoctrinating Obama into the ideas of socialist health care and claims that Obama was a big fan of single-payer when he was an Illinois state senator and nobody paid attention to what he said. Now, Quentin Young was also a 40-year veteran of the Communist Party USA until he left that to set up Democratic Socialists of America. So a Marxist indoctrinated Obama into socialist health care. And it was DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, that gave you Obamacare 
through their unions and through the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which they set up, which is 80 strong, the biggest caucus in your Congress, they've promoted this for more than 30 years. And now that they've got Obamacare, they're working hard to make it into single payer. And that's all detailed in my book. I quote them extensively. To prove a point, just before the last election, the Obama campaign put out a little video designed to mock Mitt Romney. They said, hey Mitt, guess what? The man who designed Obamacare for us, the architect of it, their words, John McDonough, Massachusetts State Legislator, formerly Harvard academic, he is the man who put it together for us, Mitt. And you know how you hate Obamacare and want to get rid of it? Well, guess what? It was John McDonough that designed Romney Care. So ha ha Mitt. And it was true, McDonough designed both systems. Romney was presented with a bill from the Massachusetts State Legislature, which is shot through with DSA supporters. He pushed it back, tried to modify it, tried to make it less socialist, but it passed and he got stuck with it. But what the Obama campaign video didn't say is that John McDonough is a former head of Boston Democratic Socialists of America. So a Marxist designed Obamacare, a bunch of Marxists promoted it through the unions and your Congress, and another Marxist, all from the same organization, indoctrinated Obama into it. 7,000 members of Democratic Socialists of America if they're allowed to get away with it, are going to socialise between one-sixth and one-quarter of your economy and change your country for the worse for forever. That's how they work. Now, the other thing the book is about, anybody here ever applied for a job with the federal government who's willing to admit it? Okay. I'm not talking about defence, that's all legitimate, and let's say at least 2% of the rest of the federal government is legitimate. Or one and a half, maybe one. Okay. But did you have to get a security clearance to get that job? An FBI security clearance. Okay. They practically go through your underwear drawers, don't they? Your family background, your childhood associates, your education, foreign travel, political associations, drug habits, the whole lot, they want to know about them. Because they need to trust you. You might be guarding a nuclear base one day. You might have secrets on your desk. You might be guarding the president. You could be in all sorts of positions of trust. And it's fair enough they need to check you out. But what if you stand for Cong what if you put on a suit and tie and stand for Congress or the Senate? And you get onto the Science and Technology Committee, or the Judiciary Committee, or the Armed Services Committee, or the um, Intelligence Committee, and you have all secrets going over your desk on a regular basis, and you have the power to influence a country of more than 340 million people, and indeed the whole Western world, how much security scrutiny do you get then? Big fat zero. Now. You can be a former member of a communist party, have gone down to Cuba more than six times like Barbara Lee. You can hang around with the communist party, write for their publication, support Cuba like Eddie Bernice Johnson. You can hang around with the committees of correspondence like um, Sheila Jackson Lee. You can have a 50 year history with the communist party like John Conyers. You can be a former, me former supporter of the, work, of the Communist Workers' Party, the most violent, militant Maoist party this country has ever seen. Five of them got shot to death in a gun battle with the KKK in North Carolina in 1979, like that beautifully coiffed, immaculately dressed Judy Chu out of California. You can hang around with the leader of the Connecticut Communist Party like Rosa DeLauro, have a big history with the Communists like Nancy Pelosi, you can be a former card, you can be a card carrying member of Democratic Socialists of America like Jerry Nadler or Jan Schakowsky or Danny Davis. 
You can hang around with the Washington State Communist Party like Senator Paddy Murray. You can be a supporter of the, of the Colombian narco-terrorists like Tammy Baldwin. I could go on and on and on. Alan West, your congressman from Florida, he got himself in trouble a couple of years ago when he said there were 80 communists in Congress. He was a bit loose in his terminology. He was also pretty light on the numbers. There's at least 100 members of your House of Representatives and probably 20 of your senators who couldn't pass a basic security test to clean the toilets at any military base in your country. Yet they are running your country. They are at the heart of your government. And many of them are allied to Cuba or North Korea or China or Iran. Many of them. The Congressional Black Caucus is going down to Cuba almost annually to confer with the Castro, those other Castro brothers, to confer with them on how to influence your House of Representatives to loosen travel and trade restrictions on Cuba. What did we used to call it when people went to enemy countries to work with the leaders of those countries against the interest of their own? Treason. Treason. Why is it not called that today? It's so blatant it is now part of the wallpaper. But it's all quoted in my book. I give examples of it. Why doth treason never prosper? Because when treason prospers, none dare call it treason. When it is so endemic, nobody calls it out. Nobody dares. And that is the state at the heart of your government today. But I don't want to depress you folks with any of that. <laughs> or bring you down in any way. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Look, if, if, if I thought there's no hope for America, if I thought there was no hope for America, I'd be back in my beautiful New Zealand right now, building bunkers and stocking up on baked beans. Okay? And I'm not mocking prepping. You should all take that seriously. But look, in 2008, the left thought they had a slam dunk. They had the House, they had the Senate, and they had their man in the White House. Their agenda was already written out, and believe me, that legislation didn't come from nowhere. It was all written out. And those 60s revolutionaries who failed back then, who had been burrowing away for 40 years, they had it all. And 40 years of hard work was coming to fruition, and they were going to steamroll middle America out of existence once and for all. They were going to destroy the middle class in this country. And in 2009, 2010, something miraculous happened. And I do not use that word lightly. What was it? You guys. You guys. Because you guys... <coughs> And you took me by more surprise than you took the left. You shocked them. They all, all they thought they had to worry about was John Boehner and his team. And that was going to be a slam dunk. They didn't expect you. You guys came out of left field, or should I say right field, <laughs> and you stood up. You stood on your constitution and you blogged and you emailed and you marched and you agitated and you phone banked. You stirred up and you put some spine into the GOP and you guys, you guys took back the house in 2010 and you brought the agenda of the left to a grinding, screeching halt. They had it. It was in their grip. They had it, and you bloody took it off them. And some of you are surprised they hate you. <laughs> some of you are surprised they call you dirty names, racist, teabaggers. Shocks you, doesn't it? Why would they call you that if you hadn't been effective? Why do they hate you so much and so dread you now? and so hope you don't get organised, and so hope you'll go away. Because they had it, and you took it off them. 
You guys need to give yourselves a huge pat on the back because you saved your country. You gave it, well, you gave it a second chance, ma'am. Had you not done what you did, all of their agenda would be in now. Obama admitted recently, he said, I would have got a lot more through without the Tea Party Republicans. Without you guys, health care would be in now. Those illegals would be voting in 2016. Card check, cap and trade, the whole lot would be law now. And where would you be then? How could you fight back from that position? Because you think if the Democrats are arrogant now, you imagine what they'd be like if you hadn't stood up and they had those 8 million votes in their pockets now. How arrogant would they be then? They wouldn't just be coming after you with the, with the IRS. They'd be using everything to marginalise and destroy their opposition, just like Hugo Chavez did in Venezuela. And I think Venezuela is the model for d the Democrats in America. That's where they're heading. This is ain't going to be like France, folks, if they get their way. It's going to be a lot more like Venezuela. So you did that, but more than that, you kick-started the second American Revolution. And this is 1776, folks. Now you think about it. You have changed school boards and county commissions all over this country. You have influenced the GOP in every single state. You've got a whole bunch of people in Congress that wouldn't have been there without you. Some of them have been disappointments, some of them not. And I don't have to emphasise this for Texas, but one of the most important things you've done is you've strengthened state legislatures all over this country. And this is a federation of independent states. You've helped those states give the finger to the federal government. Okay? And I don't have to tell you Texans how important that is. You are slowing down the Obama agenda, agenda in all sorts of ways, but you're building up a movement for the future. Now it's a small movement, well it isn't a small movement. You know, I've gone to Massachusetts and had 500 people. I've gone to Michigan and had 400 people. New Jersey, 500 people. Those blue states are full of people like you. Full of them. You're not alone, guys. And I'll tell you what, there's people all over the world rooting for you every step of the way because they know that if you can save your country and restore your constitution, that's going to help us take back our countries. This can be a worldwide freedom movement, folks. And it has to be. So, people, I'm going to do something now that will be considered very bad manners because it's the height of rudeness to go to a foreign country and give people advice on their political process. But I've already been doing it, so tough. Okay? Bring it on. People say to me, what can we do? Where we are, you know, the Tea Party is strong in some states, disunited in others. We work with the GOP well in some areas, in other areas we don't. What can we do? Well, here is my advice, folks. Now, I s believe you have two election cycles to save this country, 2014, 2016, because if the Dems take it again in 2016, I think they will go hardcore and they'll have those 8 million illegals and once they do that, I think it's going to be real tough to fight back ever. Okay, so you've got a chance to save your country peacefully, three years. Now, if you look at that time span, there's only one political force that can do the job immediately in front of us. And I know there's a whole lot of jobs to do after that, but the immediate job in front of us is to get those Democrats out, gone. And there's only one force that can do that, and that is the GOP. Now, to do that, we need every single element of the coalition. We need... Okay, the GO, it's only the GOP can do it, but there's only one force that can give the GOP the spine it needs to do the job and to make their victory worth a damn if they do. And that is you guys, okay? 
Now, you're ready. Now, I'm going to say a bit more about this. Okay, so you've got a choice. The GOP's there, but to win, you need every single element of the coalition. Every single element. You need those 1% of libertarian kids who vote for Gary Johnson or the next libertarian. You need those several million evangelical Christians who didn't even vote last time. You need the two million GOPers who didn't vote. You need the fiscal conservatives, the defence conservatives, the social conservatives. You need every single person of your base. Because those Karl Roves, they go and tell you they got to go and get the independents. And they ignore their own base. They spit on their own base. And they wonder why half it stays home. And the rest is unenthusiastic. So... This is a problem. You've got a, an election to win, and you've got a GOP old guard who's going to give you another Jeb Bush, if they can, and you're going to lose. But think back what happened in 1976. A man came out of California named Ronald Reagan. Okay? He wanted to be president, and the, grassroot, <coughs> the grassroots people very much like you but not as constitutionally educated as you, liked his message. And they pushed him and pushed him and got behind him. And what did the GOP old guard do? They hated him. They pushed back. There was no way that bloody Ronald Reagan, so I say that word a lot, that's a Kiwi word, right? That bloody Ronald Reagan was going to get the nomination. And they pipped him at the post and Gerald Ford got it. And Gerald Ford got, went up against Jimmy Carter, and Carter won. And how did those Carter years work out for you, folks? A lot of fun. Interest rates, Iran, gas queues. They were great, great times, weren't they? Stagflation. But the key thing that Reagan, those Reagan revolutionaries did not give up. And four years later, in 1980, they came back and they got behind Reagan and they forced the GOP to give them their candidate that time. Forced them. And Ronald Reagan went on to sweep the country in a landslide and change this country in all sorts of ways. Anybody going to tell me that the Reagan years weren't a big improvement on the Carter years? Huge. Now, I know that Reagan couldn't do everything he wanted. He had GB1 on his shoulder for one thing. But, he, but right now, you are Reagan, you are Carter on steroids. And you need a Reagan on steroids to lift that base. I go around this country, folks. I wear my Reagan badge at airports. I've had 16-year-old goth girls come up to me and say, wasn't he great? How do you think I'd get on with a Gerald Ford badge? <laughs> Not so good? So, the thing about this, those young, those young people, people say, oh, look, to get the young people, you've got to get some hip young liberal with a smooth haircut to get the young people on board. You had a man for many years out of Texas here. He was old. He wasn't charismatic. But the young people love him. They're Ron Paul. You know, I don't agree with all of Ron Paul's policy positions, but I'll tell you what, a lot of it I do, and the young people love him because he stands up and he doesn't back down and he's consistent and tells it like it is. So don't tell me you have to be young and hip and cool to get those young idealists on board. You have to stand up and stand for your principles. So if I was... Now, so who's the next Reagan going to be? Well, if I was in this state, it wouldn't be hard to answer the question, right? Because I don't know what's going to happen over the next few years, but you've got a guy right now who could be the, one of the greatest leaders this country's ever known. And you know who I'm talking about. Ted Cruz. Now, this is what I'd be doing if I was Ted Cruz and the people behind him. I'd be getting out there and getting that base activated right now. And I would be doing this. I would be going out and getting people on board 
and putting people forward to appeal to that base. If I was Ted Cruz, I'd be going out now and I'd say, right, I'm going to put Alan West as VP. Okay? Now, to get those young libertarian kids, I'm going to put Ron, uh, Rand Paul as Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> to hell with auditing the Fed, abolish the Fed. I would say there's going to be someone like Sarah Palin as Secretary of Energy. John Bolton, Secretary of State. And you look at all those, you look at those Christians who don't vote. What do they care about more than anything? The education of their children. They hate Common Core. They hate the attempts to clamp down on, on, on homeschooling. They hate the Department of Education. What if, what if Ted Cruz said, I'm going to put someone like John Barton in as Secretary of Education? Would that motivate those people? Mike Lee, Secretary of the Interior. There's a whole bunch of people that you know that could lift this country. Would you rally to a base like that, to a team like that? Do you think it's an impossible dream? No. Do you think it's doable? Yes. Do you think it would rally all of your base and get you enthusiastic? Yes. It does. And who is the people who can do that? Can for exactly. You people, by unifying now, by sticking... Look, you've got a choice. You've got three choices. You can go away and form a third party, condemn your children to slavery. You can get out of politics altogether, play more golf, whatever. You condemn your children to slavery. You can concentrate on local issues alone. You can condemn your children to slavery. Or you can unify and coordinate your, your Tea Party caucuses. Call them the Liberty Caucus or the Constitutional Caucus. You can finish the job of taking over the GOP and you can lay the groundwork for 2016 so that GOP has to give you the team that you want. You have to do what those Conservatives done and did in 1980, but to do that you have to stay the course, folks. You have to do those three more years. And I know it's hard work. You've done five already. It's a thankless task. But in three more years, if you work hard, that dream is within your grasp. And win or lose, if you work your butts off between now and then, win or lose, you'll be able to look yourself in the face and look your children in the face and say, I did everything I could. And ain't that worth something? So you can see how this country is going to go if you do nothing. And it ain't pretty. But you can also see the possibilities if you work. You can, the people are there. The constitutional base is there. There are more people who care about the Constitution and American exceptionalism and the ideas that you hold dear there are more people in this country now like that than there have been since the revolution. It's there. It's all there if you build and you unify, you stop bickering and you get the job done. It can be done. Don't worry about all those people in the middle, folks. Back in the first American re revolution, Less than 10% of the people supported it, and less than 3% actually fought in it. This is nothing new. You don't have to get all of middle America. There's 5% of this country trying to wreck it. There's 10% trying to save it. You just, you just need to get another 5 or 10% on your side, and you can take this country. It ain't a big, big thing. It can be done. So I'm asking you for those three years, folks. Because I come here from another country to ask you to save mine. To save your own and to save mine. To save your children and to save my children. It's three years too much to ask. 
and what can be achieved, the amazing things that can be done. Now we look back at those first American revolutionaries. They were chased across every state. They lost almost every battle. They were freezing and starving in Valley Forge. They were almost done. But they staged a surprise attack. They took the British out at Yorktown and they bloody well beat them. And how miraculous was that? There's a quote from Goethe, the German poet that I love. If you are bold, powerful forces will come to your aid. Those American revolutionaries were so bold. The French helped them, but you know there was more than that. And you know if you do everything, you will get help too. You will get help from all sorts of unexpected quarters. People will stand up, not just in your country, not just, in my, not just all over the world, folks, but not just in the material realm either. You know that it's there, but you have to stand up. Now, if you're thinking about, well, am I going to do this or not? You're thinking about your place in history. How much do you think those first American revolutionaries understood their place in history? Do you think they understood the great country they were creating? When they were getting chased all over by the British and freezing and starving and getting decimated? Do you think they understood what they were doing? Yes, do. well, well, they understood what they were creating, but they didn't understand the great country that they were going to build. So what about your place in history, folks? <laughs> you think about 200 years in the future. Some young kid will get up in front of a civics class in a high school in this town, and he'll say something like this. He'll say, hey, guys, look, you know, we've studied history, right? And we studied the second American Revolution back in the 2000s when a lot of people thought this country was done. The patriots stood up. They saved the country. They restored the Constitution against all odds. But they did it. And the liberty and prosperity we enjoy today, we owe to what they did back then. And I did some research, guys. So I looked into my family background. You know what I found? I found out that my great, 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 great grandma and grandpa, they were in the Tea Party in this town. How proud would you be? So I just want to say to you folks, thank you so much for what you're doing for my country, for your country, for liberty. God bless America, God bless Texas, and God bless the Tea Party. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll take questions now. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, I'm doing a bit of research on the communists in this town because this has been a hotbed. And I've got one friend here, Kat, who's going to help me. But if anybody's got some spare time, there's some archives in this town I need somebody to go through and just take a few photographs and photocopies of. It can be done over several months. There's no hurry. But if anybody can do that, just talk to me later and I'll, we'll discuss it. I'll give him a business card. Yeah, but just the other thing I want to say is that my cheque from the Koch brothers hasn't come through this month, and I'm sure yours hasn't either, or last month or the month before. So my books fund my travels. This is my fifth tour of the United States. I'll do two more next year. I'm here for 90 days. If I stay for 91, I get a free cell phone. Okay? <laughs> but that's not enough. So... The books fund my travels and they are good. They are very well documented and pl so please buy them and support me. So um, look, any questions? Okay, if you have a question, come on up here and, and use the microphone. I'd like to ask one myself just to start off. How does Islam fit into all of this? Yeah, I always get asked this. Well look, it's like an octopus. It has very several arms and people think, you know, these radical Islams, you know, they're sort of anti-gay, they're anti-woman, they're medievalist. They couldn't possibly like these progressives who like, you know, who love gay marriage and 
you know, all this kind of stuff. But look, we all know that the left has been infiltrating the Christian churches, the mainstream churches, and even the evangelical churches now for a hundred years. Now, the Islamic seminaries are a lot closer to Russia than the American Christian churches are. They've been in their seminaries since the 1920s. Now, we have liberation theology. The Christians have liberation theology. The Muslims have liberation Islam. A lot of what we call radical Islam is actually communist inspired or Marxist inspired. They've been working with them since the 1920s. Eon Pachepa, the head of the Romanian KGB, defected in the 70s. He's just written a great book called Disinformation. He revealed that when he was the head of the Romanian KGB in the 70s, the Soviets at that time sent 4,000 agents into the Arab world armed with anti-Semitic literature to stir up hatred against Israel and the United States. The KGB set up the PLO. They worked with Hamas. The number two man, the number two man in um, Al-Qaeda was trained by the KGB in, in Russia. The Taliban in, in Afghanistan is as much Marxist, as, as much Maoist as it is Muslim. So there's a real crossover between what we describe as radical Islam and Marxism. You know, I wouldn't say the Russians control every element of it, but they don't control every element of the unions either, or the Democratic Party, but broadly they control it. And they're using it as a battering ram against the West. And these poor dumb jihadists have no idea who manipulates them, just as these poor dumb unionists have no idea who, who manipulates them either. So, and just another little point, there's a guy called Stan, uh, Le, Stanislav Lev, no, Stan, Stanislav Lunev, Stan Lunev, who was the former head of the Russian military intelligence in America after the fall of the Berlin Wall in the late 90s. He said to a friend of mine out in Washington, uh, out in California, Jeff Nyquist, he said, if you ever see Islamic terrorists set off an atomic weapon in this country, don't believe it. It was us. We would use them as a shield. So don't believe Putin when he talks about the radical Islams and wears a cross and talks with the Russian Orthodox Church. He's no champion of Christianity. He's using the Islamics, playing like a fiddle against you guys. My name is, can you hear me? Just go ahead, speak loudly. My name is Linda Hernandez. Um, speak, speak up, Linda. Just my speak. name is, it doesn't, it's not working. No, it doesn't work. Use, use this. Just say, just say your question. Uh, my name is Linda Hernandez. I just uh, wanted to uh, thank you very much for your amazing, you know, knowledge. I think you know more than many of us do here about our country. But uh, my question is, um, I think you're right that we can stand up for what we believe in and fight. Um, many of us have been in this fight for a long time. And from day one, since Obama be, you know, started running for president, we've all known what he stood for, and that's why we're here. Um, but our children are at risk. And I just wanted to ask you, um, what is one way that we can help because the educational system is falling into their hands yeah. as we speak. So. Well, the lady is asking, what can we do with the children? Because we know they're being indoctrinated in the schools and they are the future of this country and we know there are a few of them in our movement. Now, quite often it's very hard to talk to your children but grandparents often get, a lot, get on a lot better with their grandchildren. That's because they have a mutual enemy. Okay? So you work on your grandchildren. But you need to get into the schools. There are a lot of programs teaching the Constitution in schools these days, but you need to work heavily with the homeschooled mov home school movement. Because, quite honestly, o often after meetings, I'll have young teenagers come up to me and they'll say, say something intelligent, they'll be very polite and respectful, and say, oh, you were homeschooled, right? They say, oh, how did you know? Well, you might as well have it tattooed on your forehead. Because... So those are the young people we need to work with, the homeschool people, the young Republicans, the young Libertarians. We need to get all of those on board. We're not going to get the whole swathe of them, 
but there are young idealists, the people who follow Ron Paul, for example, that we can get on board. Uh, Mr. Loudon, my name is Richard Greenow, and I'm a proud Tea Party member here in San Antonio. Good for you. Yay. And my question is, the uh, Communist Party is very subtle, very clever. Do you think they have influenced Bill and Hillary Clinton? Oh, absolutely. Um, Hillary Clinton was an Alinskyite, right? She, she, she did a thesis on Alinsky, who was a Marxist, effectively. The first law firm she ever interned for, she didn't go and work for a liberal firm. She worked for a Communist Party firm in San Francisco, Ed Truhaft's firm. The whole staff were Communist Party members, and that's where Hillary made a beeline for. When Bill went to Czechoslovakia in the 70s, while, while he was working with the left at Oxford University, went to Czechoslovakia in 1970, then on to the Soviet Union, stayed with a Czech Communist family. And the story I heard, he was recruited at that point by Czech intelligence. Both the Clintons are, are, are Marxists, effectively. Now, Bill is more of a womanizer and an egotist. Hillary's more the, more the, the doctrinaire, but they are both effectively Marxist. Thanks. Oh, yeah. So I'll take one more question. Hi, my name's Dave Marshall. My question is, are you aware of our local affiliate of the Alinsky uh, Grand Organization? The local one here is uh, COPS uh, Metro Alliance. I've been told about that. I know the Alinsky, the Alinskyites have been working in Texas for a long time, um, among, mainly among the Latino populations working with the Catholic Church. I, I'd just like to say too, because I've studied a lot the San Antonio Communists. You know, you, this has been a Communist Party centre since the days of Emma Temayuka and the Pecan Workers' Strike in the 20s. Now, right now, you've got Patty Radel, you know, who is a council member here. She's affiliated to the Communist Party. You've got a whole network of them here. The, the Castro brothers, their mother, Rosie Castro, very heavily affiliated to the Communist Party. And I'll tell you another interesting connection. In the 1920s and 30s, there was a Sutton family in this, in this town. A black family, 12 surviving kids, six of them were Communist Party members. One of them became a state senator here. I think his name was George Sutton. He worked very closely with um, Rosie Castro. But another brother went to New York, Percy Sutton, and he became the Manhattan brother, Borough President big wheel in the Democratic Party up there. Worked with Charlie Rangel, David Dinkins, the whole lot. He was also working with communist fronts the entire time. Now he mentored, he mentored and employed a man that you I'm sure you're all familiar with, and that is Eric Holder. Now the other thing he did, on the recommendation of a man called Donald Warden, a former Black Panther from Texas, also known as Sheikh um, something Al Mansour, an agent of a Saudi prince, on the recommendation of this man, Percy Sutton also wrote a letter to Harvard to get another key operative admitted to Harvard University, and that was, of course, Mr. Obama. So these networks run very deep, and there's a big, there's quite a centre here in San Antonio, and the Castro brothers are the most recent example. One more. Okay. This, th I just wanted Steve to confirm. Maybe. Oh, excuse me. How do I make this thing work? You don't. Okay. You just talk into it to be recorded. Okay. Um, I, my name is Francine Manis, and I live here in San Antonio, obviously. Um, I was just curious about something. You mentioned the Suttons. Is that the is that the Sutton family that owns the Sutton Funeral Home? They've yeah, been established yeah. for years on the yeah, east they side were, of the, town. George Sutton was a oh, was yeah. a funeral director. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They got a big funeral home, and they they've got a lot of people thinking they're just wonderful people on the east side. Well, they sure are, maybe, but they they're a Communist Party family, yeah. have been for decades. So, um, look, I just want to thank Tom for inviting me here. I want to thank all you folks for coming along tonight. I love being here amongst you guys. I'm so proud of what you're doing, and I'm 
just egging you on. You've got to get that Ted Cruz up there, folks. So come down and buy my books. But thanks very much for coming along tonight. Thanks. Would you take those? Can I sign autographs over here? Or do you want me to do it here? Okay, sure. Um, if you have a book and you want it signed, come on up over here. Also, don't forget your wait staff. We are taking care of uh, tipping the wait staff through those donations on the counter on the counter back there. Okay, so you know, please donate so we can pay the wait staff and, and get them what they deserve for their hard work. Thank you to Lubies. Thank you all for coming out. And remember, October nineteenth in Floresville, three o'clock. Rafael Cruz. Thank you for coming.